Hello, my amazing people. I greet you according to your time. If it is your first time and you like what we are doing here, kindly subscribe. Put on your notification bell. To all notifications is very, very important because it will enable you to know when we upload a new video. Here we react to all forms of videos. We educate, we inform the members of the public about what is happening. And to you, YouTube, I appreciate you for creating this wonderful platform that we are using to disseminate information. At the same time, I put a disclaimer that here in Linda's TV show, we do not promote violence, we do not promote hate speech, we do not promote misleading information. Rather, we are here to educate, inform the members of the public and also to remind you to that a call for self-determination is never a call for war. Every country in the world have this. Winning, tuning in. So let's start you know, with the Southeast Governor's meeting. What are your thoughts on their resolve to meet with President Bola Tinumbu over Inamdi Kano's predicament? Well, basically, political issues and political prisoners have always been treated in a very different way from the ordinary criminals on the road. When you are in government, you have to display a lot of wisdom in handling political issues. I'll give you an example. United States had already cornered Julian Assange, the wiki leader founder, who they accused of leaking some classified document that embarrassed United States. But they also realized that they had to make a balance between free speech, between the freedom of journalists, and trying to bring a journalist to trial. They know that Russia is holding some of their citizens who are journalists and they are trying to bring espionage charge against them. Knowing this, they know that even if they bring this man to the United States, they will still you know, face some backlash. They now went through wisdom and did a plea bargain and released this man from jail and allowed him to get back to Australia. Nam de Kanu has not done anything that other people from other zones have not done. We know about Sunday Boho of the Yoruba nation agitator. We know of the Boko Haram people that say they want a different country where Western education is an abomination. These people have been released. Not just that they have been released. In the case of Boko Haram, they've been re-assimilated to the society, giving plum jobs, even in our military. They've been given money and been resuscitated, reconciled, and rehabilitated. Why is Nam De Kanu's case different? There is an ethnic and some unnecessary bias that is keeping that man in jail. The government should be wise enough to release this man. You can use the Julian Assange option if you don't want to say you are losing face. You can release him conditionally. You can release him unconditionally. As a lawyer, I've watched the legal issues very clearly. And I saw that even in the courts, from the high court to the Supreme Court, there are discordant tones amongst them. Even in the issue of bail, some of the tier of the courts are granted him bail. Even in the issue of the charges, some tier of the court had quashed all the charges so you can see that the government has a lot of places it can stand to release the young man and bring peace to the Southeast. He is now more like a political prisoner. I tell you something. The longer Nam De Kanu is in prison, the taller he becomes and the shorter the government becomes. They should take the intelligent way out of this and release him like they did to other people. Rehabilitate him and reconcile him as they are reconciling Southeast completely to the nation. I'm glad you brought up that Julian Assange case because um, analysts uh, have been looking into the similarities uh, between these two cases. And what stuck out with me majorly is the fact that Namdi Kanu fled bail uh, back in 2017, much like Julian Assange. But what it seems right now is it's more of a political situation uh, with Namdi Kanu. With Julian Assange, it seemed that the uh, 
potentness or the pungentness of his uh, crimes seemed to deteriorate as the world grew and as time went on and more leaks like this happened. In the case of Namdi Kanu, some could argue that him staying in jail, of course, it's uh, unfortunate, but him being released would also lead to some uh, unintended consequences uh, in terms of an escalation of violence. This is allegedly, uh, et cetera. And the reigniting of his uh, followers who seem to be scattered all over the world and seem to be a bit of a thorn in the flesh of uh, individuals who have been suffering the sit at home uh, uh, orders and all the other violence that has come about. How will they be able to balance uh, those two equations of uh, keeping him in jail, which is uh, which is worse, keeping him in jail or letting him out and potential violence uh, uh, escalating? What are your thoughts on that? My thought is this. I brought the Julian Assange issue just to tell you that the government can use wisdom and bring about situation where they will tell him, you've spent so, 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 and so time in detention. Let us count it for you as any punitive measure for whatever they may say he had done. Allow him to plea to any minor offense that will suit that number of times he has already stayed and release him. That's why I brought the Julian Assange. That's wisdom. Then secondly, you can release him conditionally and tell him, look, this will bring crisis if we release you. No responsible government will say, let us release you when we have not gotten a commitment from you that you will no longer go along this line. The young man had said that he is willing to negotiate, that he is willing to talk. So you talk to him, that is releasing him conditionally. Then the third one is releasing him unconditionally. So you have a choice, but the three of them will land in releasing him. The most important thing is that a government checks the cost-benefit analysis in whatever it is doing. And I can tell you that the benefit of releasing him, if you can make him to get commitment on what you want him to do after releasing him, will be better than keeping him. Because keeping him has not solved the security situation in the Southeast. It has not stopped the agitation. As a matter of fact, it is making even the agitation to now be multifaceted, to now be unknown. That's why you hear the unknown gunman. So it's more difficult to tackle. So releasing him, in my own opinion, will be better off now than keeping him. The benefit of releasing him will be better than the cost. So you negotiate with him, know the best option, and release him. Now, Mr. Okonkwa, talking about the issue of security, the governor's also resolved to tackle insecurity in the southeast. You know, but that's a big, a bit vague when we consider what's been happening in that region over the years. So what measures would you advise must be taken by the governors, the federal government, you know, to tackle insecurity in southeast Nigeria? You know, I've always said, I'm sorry to say it, that the governors can only make promises, but they do not have what it takes to enforce that their promise. That's why I'm talking about state police. Because the police we have now answers to the Inspector General of Police and answers to the federal government. So no matter their plan, no matter their opinion, no matter the objective they have to tackle insecurity, it is still subject to the efficiency and effectiveness of the national police, which is outside the purview of their power. So the best way this federal government can tackle insecurity at the regional and state levels is to grant state police to the states amend the constitution. People always talk about abusing state police. Let me state it clearly here that I am not assuring anybody that some governors will not abuse state police. They will. And the reason is because the federal government abuses federal police at times. Is it not with the federal police that they use to rig election? Is it not with the federal police that they use to do certain things? So that the mere fact that some state governors will abuse state police will not be the reason you will say the right thing should not be done. 
Because the abuse we are getting now from kidnappers, from terrorists, from rapists, from unknown gunmen, from all those people are more than what any state governor can use state police to abuse the people in. And let me tell you, when the government is acting, the people have recourse to the law to seek redress. When outlaws are acting, the people have no recourse to claim any damage or to even stop them from doing anything. So they will just be dying for nothing. So the abuse that the state governors will subject the state police to is very much better than the abuse we are receiving from the outlaws, from the terrorists, kidnappers, from the armed robbers, and from assaulters of integrity and the personality of human beings. So they should be given state police. Then again, the Southeast governors, they should cooperate because the landmass of the Southeast is not so much. So whoever does any crime in Enugu can sneak into a bony, to Abia. And if they do not cooperate, they won't be able to trace the criminals within the regional level. The state level will be too small for them to operate. So it's good for them to cooperate to eliminate the threat of insecurity. The unknown gunmen are known. It is only an inefficient government that will be attributing insecurity to unknown gunmen. Please, is there any criminal that brings himself to advertise himself when he wants to commit crime? Every criminal wants to be unknown. So the mere fact that you're saying things are committed by unknown gunmen, you are actually displaying your incompetence. So there is nothing that is committed by an unknown person. It is committed by a criminal. They should through competence and cooperation, hunt down these criminals so that the Southeast people who are traders and travelers by nature will be able to carry out their functions for their livelihood. Fair enough. But in your discussion, it seems that the state police versus the way it is now is a choice between the lesser of two evils. But I want to discuss the governors and the, well, the negotiating capacity of these Southeast governor, governors and their ability to work together, as you have just pointed out, in order for any kind of economic prosperity to move along, in order for the insecurity to get checked, there needs to be communication and collaboration between all of them. What is the likelihood with this crop, uh, this new crop of Southeast governors, in your opinion? I'm not sure I got your last question because the line was cracking a little bit. I can repeat it. I'm, in terms of cooperation with the Southeast governors, uh, how likely and how effective do you think that will be, especially with this particular group of Southeast governors that uh, are in power right now at the helm of those other five governors who met in Enugu for the uh, Southeast governors meeting? Well, obviously, from the picture of what we saw, they projected reasonable level of unity because I saw all the governors present. They did not send any delegate. So all of them were present. At least pictorially, that is an exhibition of unity. Then again, they do not have a choice. They have to work together. Like I said, before anything happens, the landmass of the Southeast is not that much. It's not elaborate. So somebody can strike in Enugu, and in 30 minutes or less, he's already in another state. So if you make a rigid boundary, then the criminals will be getting away with their crimes because they will be sneaking into other states. So they don't really have a choice. And their cooperation is very, very easy because they share cultural, is monocultural, is monolingual, is monoethnic. So everything that affects one state affects the other. So it is easy to cooperate. And again, they, they, they come from different political parties, not one, not two. So their diversity will compel them to cooperate. So the issue here is that 
the level of insecurity in Southeast is much. And the, no state has monopoly of the violence. They cross border to other states. What is happening in Anambra may just be coming from Imo State. What's happening in Imo State may be coming from Abia. So there must be cooperation if they will succeed. And I believe, from what I saw, knowing that their existential threat is now very, very major and affects all of them, I believe they will come together to find solution to the problem. But the government, federal government, has to empower them. It will be very unnatural to think that a tier of government will succeed when they have the power to make laws, but they don't have the agency to enforce their laws. This is why it is inevitable, as it happens in other climes. In America, even the local government has its own police. So any tier of government that has the power to make laws must have the power and the agency to enforce those laws. Otherwise, it will be giving somebody responsibility without giving him authority to perform. In management, there must be parity of authority and responsibility before objectives are achieved. If authority is more than responsibility, it leads to abuse of power. If responsibility is more than authority, it leads to lack of performance. There has to be parity in this. For now, the state governments have only responsibility to keep peace in their states, but they don't have the authority to execute and bring about that peace. That authority should be given to them in the, in the, in the name of state policy. Mr. Kenneth Okonkwo, recently, you know, we had news that some northern senators and cattle breeders are against the passing of the anti-open grazing bill, saying it is against their freedom to reside anywhere in Nigeria, as stated by Section 42 of the 1999 Constitution. I'd like you to react to this. First of all, that is a misinterpretation of the Constitution. The Constitution said any Nigerian citizen has the right to reside in any part of Nigeria and has the freedom of movement. As a matter of fact, the law is very clear that animals are not given the freedom to roam about because animals are known to either destroy lives or destroy livelihoods. So when you talk about cattle, when you talk about herbivorous animals, you're talking about animals that destroy livelihoods. Rearing animals and planting crops, these are the two sides of agriculture. It will be, I'm sorry to say it, it will be insensitive for anybody to think you'll be growing in your quest for agrarian revolution by using one set of agriculture to destroy the other set. Cattle and herbivorous animals eat up plants. You need plants, you need animals for your food. So saying you will allow the cattle to eat up the plants is actually being unwise because you are destroying agriculture thinking you are improving it. Now, the issue of banning the open grazing, I am really very shocked that any human being in the 21st century will even open his mouth to say you will allow these young, beautiful children to be following animals from Medugri to Port Harcourt, from Sokoto to Lagos, trekking through the forest where they will be drugged, where they will be brainwashed, where they will be traumatized and terrorized without option of going to school. And you're saying your own children will be going to the best of schools. And the children of the poor and less privileged will be condemned perpetually to live in forests, in terrorist-infected forests, to trek with animals. You have reduced these children to the level of animals. I can tell you, hardly will any child move from Medugri to put or trekking in Nigeria today without meeting one kind of Waterloo or the other, or without coming out becoming a terrorist himself. All the crimes that are being committed in Nigeria today are committed in the forest. And then 
what is the security of the cattle in itself? Because the cattle will end up being rustled by the terrorists. There is no more safety in the forest as it used to be. And these children are entitled to go to school. They are not entitled to be condemned to become animals. And when you allow animals to pass through the cities, we are talking about cholera. Cholera is the filthiness and the contamination of the water you drink by basically the feces of animals and human beings being defecated in open place. We are talking about human beings defecating in open place. But we're talking about animals freely defecating in open place when you allow this open grazing. And then water, rain will fall and wash them into the streams, which some of these people drink. And even some of the water, the people they drink. And it will cause cholera. In this modern time, anti-grazing law is not only, it's not only immediate, should not only be immediate, but should be immediately done and agreed by everybody. What are they saying? They didn't wow. say they are banning you from your, being a pastoralist. They simply said you should organize it in a manner that those children will be tending to their animals, going to school, and it's not constituting a nuisance to the people and to themselves. Well, even Okunko. the animals themselves, they don't even come out better when they do all those trekking. So well, anti-grazing law Okunko. is not only that it is acceptable, it should be done. Well said. It is wicked well to said. allow children who should be in school to be in the forest? Mr. Okonko, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we have extended our time. You have made a lot of very relevant points. It is always great to have you on a guest, as a guest on our program. Thank you so much for joining us today on News. I think it was just yesterday or a couple of days ago that I did a video about Kenya expressing my wholehearted solidarity with the protesters. Those who are willing to protest for the betterment of their welfare, their collective welfare, and for their country. In fact, what is happening in Kenya is a model for other African countries. I expect to see that in Uganda. I expect to see that in Nigeria. I expect to see that in South Africa. I expect to see that in Cameroon and other African countries. The citizens should take their destinies into their hand. They should assert their wishes of which if the government fails to meet the demands, then they should show the government, understand, the stuff they are made of. The Igbos have a saying that when the god or when a god or a deity misbehaves, they show it the stick from which it was carved. That is what the Kenyans are doing. And in case you are not following the events in Kenya, I'm telling you, police, soldiers, everyone is running for their lives. Those in the parliament who voted for that insensate, insensitive bill are now running for their lives. In case you're not following things, let me read out the demands of Kenyans to you, one after the other, so that you would know that Kenyans actually want a change for them. Now, number one, the Kenyans are saying to President Ruto, he said, scrap the illegal and illegitimate chief administrative secretary. I repeat, scrap the illegal and illegitimate chief administrative secretary. That is one on demand. Number two, the Kenyans are demanding from Ruto. They said, removal of public funding of the office of the first lady, second lady, and prime cabinet secretary's spouse, and instead redirect those funds to employment of teachers and doctors. Did you understand what they said there? Yeah? Very good. Number three, the man, they said, scrapping of the housing levy, then publishing of audited records, records on how the funds have been utilized and refunded for all contributors. <laughs> Publish how you spend the money and then refund whatever is left now to all those who contributed to that housing levy. Number four, immediate firing of all government officials with criminal records and integrity issues. That is number four demand by the Kenyans. Then number five says, reduce wastage of public funds in government, including travel. 
between March and uh, between uh, January and March, I said it in my video before. Your Tifnubu, that stupid president, spent 8.6 billion naira on travel so within just three months. 8.6 billion naira. Go to my video there, you will see where I said issues like that. You know, in challenge, understand? You know, to the uh, the the, the uh, June 12 speech that president of Nigeria delivered. Now let's go to number you know number six. Number six says conduct a lifestyle audit for flashy state officers. Conduct a lifestyle audit for flashy state you know officers. Number seven says fire corrupt cabinet secretaries. Fire corrupt you know cabinet secretaries. Number not eight says create more opportunities for the youths. Number nine says members of parliament MPs should not earn more than doctors. <laughs> Number ten reduction of members of parliament salaries and allowances. Capping them at 200,000 Kenyan shillings. That is approximately $1,560. The government should reduce the members of parliament salaries. I told you, I spoke about the parliament you know, you know, salaries we're talking about. I told you that in the, in the June 12 speech delivered by your president when he was telling the rubbish, he did not tell that the senator was collecting 2.5 million naira monthly. The Kenyans here are telling the, the Ruto to reduce that. Understand? And no, they gave him the amount to be paying them, which is what? 200,000 Kenyan shillings, which is equivalent to what? $1,560. Then number 11, he said to curb wastage, the list advises that all government officials should use government vehicles, trains, and airplanes. <laughs> Become like ordinary people. That is what the, the list is talking about here. List number 12 says, constitute the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission within the next 30 days. Did you hear that? In fact, number 13 says here, Employ junior secondary school teachers and intern doctors. That's what 13 is saying. And let me shock you with the final demand, which I said already in my last video, that I told the Kenyans that if you want to succeed, in fact, the overall thing for people to do is to make sure that Ruto leaves office point blank. And as if I knew, understand, it is also there in one of their demands here. And what are they saying here? They are saying, the, number 14 says, the final demand is that the president resigns from office. <laughs> that is how it is supposed to be. Gosh, the Kenyans are very serious they are very, very serious. And I cannot express my happiness, my satisfaction enough for the great people of Kenya. Today, I read, you know, something on, I think, uh, Phoenix by one Adamu Garba, one idiot, who had once contested for presidency in that zoo you call Nigeria. He was saying that IPOP cannot win a referendum in the country because uh, an average Igbo man you know wants to remain in Nigeria I want to tell that idiot that idiot that you can never speak for us you are nobody to decide for us and you cannot think that your, your opinion that stupid opinion that opinion that emanated from fear because you know you knew what is going to happen you see cannot influence us in any way if you think Nigeria is not afraid, or Nigeria thinks uh, we cannot win a referendum, let the referendum continue everywhere. And I've said it severally, and I'll keep on repeating again, that you cannot kill a Biafran and go scot free. 1967 is gone. It is not 2004. This time around, our people are ready to break away to secede from Nigeria once and for all. 
If you like, you can keep your zoo. Nobody cares about it. If you like, you can blaspheme Simon Epa. Say whatever you like, understand? Simon Epa is doing the right thing. You see, this time around, we have put our lives at the crossroads and we have no shred of fear and we fear no death. As long as we live, we are raising men not men who are the slightest difficulty or you know you know confrontation they would run away but men who would sustain the struggle as long as they breathe until biafra is restored whether you like it or not biafra is a reality take it or you leave it take it to the bank as long as we live we must continue to defend ourselves there is no moral law. No moral law forbid a person to defend himself, even if it has to do with killing your attackers in self-defense. No, it is not a crime under any moral law. That's just a fact about it. In fact, sometimes whenever I read, I am often bewildered, you know, at the inaction of my people, you see, to the massacres or to their massacres in the past but this time around i am telling you you see hmm, oppression repression subjugation begets rebellion anyhow you bring it we are going to rebel against it there must be rebellion oppression begets rebellion that's the fact about it this time around that we are this time around we are not going to fold our hands and look at you killing our people if you kill one, we are ready for you. We are saying it that the Biafra restoration is a reality. Get it, take it to the bank. Thank you so much for sticking to this video to the end. Like I said before, now it's time for us to go to the comment section to air our mind and our opinion. Say what you think about this video and this platform. Do it constructively. Share this video like, subscribe, and also continue to watch Linda's TV show because this is the home of news. Until I see you again in my next video, remain blessed. For now, I would say bye-bye.